All right, welcome everyone. It's July 19th and hmm, let's pause <laughs> for a moment. Let's just kind of sink into the fact that it's July 19th, everyone, and a powerful full moon coming up at the end of this week. So um, prepare your house for the full moon to arrive and whatever that means to you, whatever that feels right to you, if it means that you clean the front, make sure the front is swept and maybe there was um, like a drawer that, that you've been wanting to clean out, maybe this is a good time to do that before the arrival of the full moon. And uh, why don't we slowly just tune into ourselves for a moment. You can choose to close your eyes or you can lightly look down towards the floor. That can be very helpful as well. But you're not directly at looking, directly looking at the screen right now. And just connecting with the topic that the, we have been discussing the idea of uh, divisions and feeling split inside, polarizations inside us, and maybe a sense of discombobulation, a sense of ungroundedness. And just noticing where you are feeling that the most. Are you feeling that in your lower body? Are you feeling that in your heart center? Are you feeling that right at the throat? Maybe what you're believing and speaking may not be in congruency. So just see where the split is. Maybe you're trying to move forward in your life using your legs, your locomotions, basically the legs help us to move into the next phase, next place, from point A to point B, but maybe how you are moving in your life really isn't the expression of what your true values are inside. So notice the areas of tensions. Sometimes we don't notice the tensions enough so that they become knots. They get knotted up. So before they become these knots that are much more difficult to unknot, untie, to disassemble, find the tensions are building up. Take a moment and scan your body, front and also back. We often forget the backside of who we are. And coming back to your heart center and also ask yourself, are there things that you have been saying yes to, even though these things do not match up, they're not in consistency or in alignment with your own true value. And maybe you've been saying no to things that scare you, that could have a potential opening, but it's so new that it's difficult to say yes to because your mind tends to want to go find the past examples. I've been here before. That calms the brain. So when you introduce new patterns, the brain is scrambling to find resources to say, this feels familiar. But so many of us are not in the place of familiarity right now. So see if you could just stand in that tension without having to fix anything. And going back to last week, 
the sound of yum. Just silently feel that in your heart center, the sound yum. And I have asked all of you to check in with things that you needed to let go. Not just what's in your closet, but the closets of your patterns, your old ways of navigating through the life. What are some of the things that you've been able to let go of? What are some of the things that you know you need to let go of? And take a moment right now to see if you could open the heart center for what is wanting to come through without you trying, without you seeking. What is the universe wanting to inspire in you? What is the inhale? Where's this inhale coming from? In order for the universe to give you the inhale, which inspires us all, we need to exhale. So take another few more seconds here to see if you could let go of things that the you can let go of today. And imagine that you're standing at your favorite spot. Could be maybe uh, right by a tree. Could be a side of um, like a rock. Could be a river bank. Stand in that space of your choice in your mind and your heart. Create stillness, feel grounded and supported while the earth spins slower than ever before, yet things are spinning faster and moving fast and zipping by you. There are many speeds that are making us divided inside, but see if you could find that still point, the sound yum, is the seed sound, as I explained last week. That's the forever, never changing sound of the still point of the heart. So see if you could come back to that seed sound of yum. And gradually, when you feel ready, opening your eyes, move a little bit, maybe roll your shoulders, open and close your fingers and your hands, twist a little bit, come back to this space. And the pendiculation would be a good time to do this right now. Mm, a little cat stretch, midday cat stretch. Mid-afternoon, evening cat stretch, morning cat stretch. Did you know that the cats and dogs actually do the pendiculation like 50 times a day? And we do it like maybe once, right? Right is when you wake up. So incorporate more of the cat stretch. Okay. Well, I will hand this over to Chris for a moment here. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm speechless. What can I say? <laughs> really? You? Well, after doing that, I really felt the, um, the, the layers of activity in my life that are trying to pull away in different directions. And so it's that, um, 
the image is a it's not a very nice one but it's the image of being drawn and quartered so for those of you who aren't familiar with medieval torture techniques um, what that means is they used to tie a person's body each limb to a different horse okay that's probably go, enough chris you're you're, yep, you're you working the with the empaths and intuitives here okay yep. that that's enough image for me it's, it's excruciating yes. is the point and and it's something that I think that we get we let that get away from us when we're not paying attention and taking time to be still. And so um, that might be a good time to talk about switching and how active our brains become. Um, and this isn't really a goal that we should aspire to, in my opinion, because what I mean by switching is we have this idea of um, multitasking. So we've heard a lot of talk about multitasking over the years, but the truth of it is we're not particularly suited to it. Uh, some of us can pretend that we're better than others because we seem to be productive. But the fact is when we're constantly switching between different activities and tasks and thinking and feeling and different ideas that we're having and paying attention to our surroundings, each time we jump, we're expending a tremendous amount of energy to do that. And it really draws down on our total amount of energy that we have available to us. And so there's this, some of you perhaps have, have heard some of this before when we talk about it from the perspective of brain waves. And so, you know, the, on the, the spectrum of brain waves from the very slowest brain waves that we have only in the deepest levels of sleep. Um, it's the delta, the delta waves, the very slow ones, single digit hertz. So very slow. And then from there you have theta, which you can have when you're uh, asleep or semi-conscious. It's a very restorative, um, imaginative state. And then from that you move up to alpha, which is a very creative and uh, deliberately creative state where you get to explore possibilities and dream about new things. And from that, we move into the beta band. And the beta is such a big part of our day to day that um, it's been divided into three levels low, mid, and high. And so most of us spend a good amount of time in this beta state, which is the state of active. Um, thinking and planning, maybe worrying about things, but all the way up to the high beta wave state, which is where we're expending a huge amount of energy, often on um, just worrying about what's going to happen, what the outcome might be. A lot of anxiety happens in that beta wave, the high, the upper band of the beta wave state. And so taking time to draw it back down and and settle and close our eyes and be still is so important because otherwise what we're doing essentially is we're constantly switching stimulating jumping from one thing to another and for many of us our energy reserves are already low enough that each time we make that jump to the new thing we may actually be lacking energy and when we lack energy that forces our our brain and our adrenal glands to send a signal to have the fight or flight response. So just put that all into perspective for a moment. If you're constantly jumping from task to task, thought to thought, not really giving your full attention to just being here and just focusing on what is before you to do, you're potentially putting yourself into a state where you are constantly triggering your fight or flight response. And so you're living as if it's a survival emergency all the time. And so taking this, these still moments and these little breaks to do what we just did, whether it's guided or not. Um, like last week, when we started, it was before we turned on the recording, but we just sat for two minutes with our eyes closed, breathing slowly. And it's something that you can even do while you're listening here. It may actually help you pay closer attention, but I'm, I'm going to just give one more example of um, 
something that I did over this weekend, which is uncharacteristic because like so many people, I have a lot of things on my plate. I'm often thinking about them. I'm often moving from one thing to another. And so what I did is I went to one of our bookcases over the weekend. It was Friday evening. I finally had a moment to sit down and do something relaxing. And I, I was feeling a little tired, so th there was a temptation to turn on the TV. But I decided I'd rather read, because I hadn't read a book in a while. And I went to my bookshelf, and I started pulling out some different titles, things by classical Sufi masters and you know, people like Ibn Arabi and the very, very complex writings. And I, I scanned down on the shelf and there was a book there that I realized I'd never read before. And I'd had it since I was a classroom teacher. So it was a young adult fiction book. And I pulled it out and I just started flipping through it. And it was a very quick read. So I read the first chapter before I even realized it standing there. And I thought, you know, I've never read this book. I think I'm going to read it. So I started reading it and then I really was enjoying it. And the next day on Saturday, I spent another three or so hours just sitting and reading the book until I was done. And that was such a restorative and relaxing thing. The first question I asked myself is why am I not doing this more often? You know, what, what is driving me? What, where is the whip cracking? behind me that's making me think that I have to be in perpetual motion. And so what, what that brings me back to is this place that so many of us are in right now, which is this constant state, and I'll just name it burnout. And usually when I start talking about burnout, heads start to nod, because most people can uh, relate to that on some level, if not now, at some other point in your life, certainly. And what we find is that the more that we're jumping from task to task and, and experiencing this widening of division internally, we're just making that burnout cycle burn hotter. And essentially what that means is we're working harder and we're getting less back. So we're just spinning our wheels and spending resources that we don't have for less. When really, if we just sat and enjoyed a few moments of, of stillness or even, even relaxed attention, like reading, it doesn't have to be a whole book, but even reading a chapter of one book and just staying with it, it does so much for our nervous system and our minds and our hearts and our bodies. And um, it really helps to bring us back into this state of, of wholeness, which is really what we're, we're talking about all the time when we come together to do these talks. So I'll, I'll pause there for a minute and uh, we'll see what else comes up. <laughs> and I think the Richard's comment that's really, um, you know, for those of you that are frequent the Facebook, but it says the internet, especially Facebook seems to put us into that high beta wave state it seems yeah i mean you know these um these social media platforms as well as google search and netflix they they all have brain scientists working behind it you know behind the scenes so they know how to trigger these states and they know how to capture your attention but also for only a few seconds at a time and then go to the next and next and I, I realized how tired I had been when I no longer could read one short article on the internet over the weekend. I just couldn't even finish more than two paragraphs. And I thought, oh, this is ridiculous. So what I did was I brought my yoga mats outside and I happened to come across Alice Coltrane, the you know famous um, what's, what's, um, what's his first name, Chris? John Coltrane. John Coltrane. Yeah. John Coltrane's wife's recording her devotional recording curtain. So basically like, um, yogic singing, chanting, devotional music that she played with organs. And then, um, she would sing it and that was recorded and it was not like 
something that she was going to sell or anything like that. It was something that she recorded for herself, really, that was discovered. And that was something that I came across. So I played that in the background and I just did like literally five poses and I would stay in the same pose for a long time and I'll do the next. And um, I just really couldn't even read anymore. So I just did that. And that music was very helpful for me. And it was not type of music that went from high notes to the lower notes or complicated. It was really stayed in the same zones of where when you do a harmonium type of thing, you will have a drone sounds in the background. It stayed in the similar range. So it was very, very calming to me. And what ended up happening was after I did that, about a half an hour later, I realized I had been so exhausted. My mind had been so exhausted that I just said to Chris, I think I'm going to go take a nap. And I couldn't, it was not a nap. It was 90 minute nap. So that's considered to be not a nap, right? So I actually literally slept for 90 minutes, an hour and a half. Just, um, I could not do anymore. That human doing was leaving me. So you know, I think when you're in that state of having to do and you feel like you have to do in order to what fill the blank, you know, to be accepted, to be to be um, feel like you're worth something or you're enough. Um, many of us been in that rat race and maybe some of you say, well, I haven't, but maybe you have in a different way by signing up for this, reading this, Facebook this, check this Instagram um, you know, so might not be outwardly showing as your job or, you know, the way you are outwardly doing things, but maybe internally you are taking yourself through that exhausted state and you don't even know it till you reset. So I, I pay attention to like words and what words are people are using. And these days people are using a lot of words that starts with re, you know, regroup, reset, rejuvenate. Um, what is it? Some other ones, Chris, help me out here, but the, um, even the removal, but also reassess, rehydrate, like he just did with his water, right? There's a lot of words that starts with re. And to me that shows societally that we're all kind of thinking like the speed in which we were rushing through this road, you might find that, oh, this wasn't, this is somewhat a dead end. We need to return. We need to take a U-turn to come back, to realign ourselves, to come back to the journey that we are meant to walk on. So pay attention to that rewords that's all over right now. When you open anything, there's, you'll find that, you know, re something, right? Um, then you know that the wow, as a society, we're using these words, maybe most of the time, not even knowing how far we've gone off, off the course, right? So yeah, reread, right? Penny says reread. So um, see if you can course correct, right? Course correction can take some time, depending on how far you've gone off but we can always course correct. That's the cool part of it. And when it comes to health, I wanted to mention a little bit about the course correction is that some of us are like a giant cargo ship that's coming from, let's say across Pacific ocean or, it, you know, um, some other areas. But the fact is these cargo ships are giant, right? They're like the size of a city block or, um, thousands of people work in it, almost practically live in it, and then they have to ship these things out. Um, my brother was in a, one of the really large Navy ships, so I have been on one of those giant Navy ships. That are, it's like a city on its own. But for those ships to make course corrections, it's not a three-point turn, right? Just go back up and then go forward and back up a little bit and then make a turn. You have to make about I don't even know, let's just call it 27 point turn. So it takes time to course correct. 
And I'm saying this because I'm seeing a lot of my clients getting a little bit um, feeling like, I, when do I get better? When I, I started taking this two weeks ago, well, how, when am I going to see the difference? And I see this all the time. And I have to remind them that this is a course correction. And it's going to take some time. And I think this is one of the disservices of the kind of the new spiritual world where we, you know, some of us have started to say, you think it and you can manifest it. You know, it's going to be a spontaneous shift that you can enjoy. And that is getting in the way of the reality of this physiology is that your mindset can shift instantaneously. Your heart can be in relationship with the mind immediately. Okay. However, the physiology takes time. Um, I work with several cancer patients right now that are at four, uh, stage four, but they didn't contact me till they were diagnosed with the stage four cancer. So for them to change the course that, that they've been on, I have to remind them that their cancer did not manifest yesterday. It has been manifesting for a long time. So a good rule of thumb, and don't take this as a negative, you know, kind of a thing. It's that if you've had a chronic issues for 30 years, plan for 30 months to course correct. Okay. If you've been doing certain things and then they've been, that's been your difficulties that you've been dealing with in a relationship or whatever. Think of it. How long have I been in this? Have I been in this rut for 25 years? Then give yourself 25 months. I think that's a reasonable ask for this cellular being to slowly shift and at the same time, spontaneously make the decision to know that you have the healing power in you. That decision and that knowing can happen instantly. So there's an instant shift and there's such thing as it might take you 30 months. Okay. But you can get there. You can hold the both truths at the same time. So you might feel split. You know, some of my cancer clients that I work with, they feel very divided. They feel like they know they have the healing power on one hand, but then they also feel really, really distraught because they're at stage four cancer and they are wanting to heal themselves today. Hold both truths that you can heal, you can change your mindset, and you have the healing power. Miracles do happen. And also, it might take you some time at the cellular level for that, your body to begin to change and shift because it does take about 180 days for just for your red blood cells to turn over and change. So I'll pause there for a moment and there's some comments yeah, coming in and there yeah. are there's some comments um let's read a couple of those and then i'll tell you what you stirred up for me uh deborah said i think i think in quotes knowledge is power the more i know the better person i will be to myself and others because i learned something about myself so part perfectionism i believe the information i'm consuming is course correcting because i will do better i'm going to come back to this in a second. And Mary Jo says, reminds me, is, this is what you were just saying, uh, Masami, a minute ago, reminds me of people that want fixed in one massage session. I remind them they didn't get that way overnight. And uh, I'm just, so these rewords, uh, this is really interesting. What it made me think of is that, you know, recycling, we, we have all these re- concepts were coming back to the same ground again and again it made me wonder if we're not experiencing what this this might be a little bit on the philosophical side but it makes me wonder if we're not experiencing an increase in, of entropy in the system meaning the the quality of the energy is being degraded and that makes it more uniform and less um, available for more things. So for example, if you, if you burn wood, it turns into heat and ash. And 
those things are really only useful so far. Sure, you could take ash, and if you're a homesteader, you might be able to make some soap if you got some tallow lying around, and the heat might uh, warm your house for a little while, but then it's gone, it dissipates. And so that energy changes shape in the system and it's no longer available. And so it makes me wonder if in the context of reworking and revisiting and retreating and doing all these things that we're doing, running over the same old ground, I'm well, quoting Pink Floyd again, I mean, what is going on? What have we found? Same old fears. Um, that's that's what we need to look at and i think that what we're seeing is that we lack concentration we lack focusing our attention for periods of time that allow us not only to go more into the depth of what's here that includes ourselves um, but also to conserve our energy because when we're doing just one thing and when we're being present with just one thing, we're not scattered. We're not spewing out these sparks of energy in all directions. So I, and then, you know, one other thought that came to mind with uh, what you said earlier about this, the spirituality of the day um, has us, it would have us believe that if we can think something or believe in it strongly enough, we can manifest it. And while there is, there is some, some truth to that, um, there's an, I just happened to come across an article yesterday and it was a professor at the University of Buffalo and he just ran an experiment to demonstrate that in a Western cultural context, practicing mindfulness increases selfish tendencies. Because, because in our culture, we have we're geared toward individualism instead of communalism, instead of, you know, operating as a we, we operate as an I. And so what he, he was able to demonstrate now, I, I wouldn't take this as a definitive um, discovery that he's made, but it's something that's observable. And so what he said is for most people, when they practiced mindfulness for a period of time, and then were given a task that involved, um, working on behalf of a, a charity where they were, you know, stuffing envelopes that a charity would send out for fundraising, something like that. They found that the people who practiced, who had the mindfulness practice versus just um, aimlessly doing something for 15 minutes came out of it and they had a lower result by like 17% in terms of their willingness to stay and help do something that was philanthropic. So, what where, what am I saying here? This is all going in a circle because it's we, we have to do a couple of things. It's not enough to just think it and wish it. We also have to inhabit our own being. And, and I go back up to um, what Deborah mentioned earlier about the, uh, let me find her comment. It's this idea of improving ourselves. And, and I think that when we find that ground of being and we connect on that level what is there to improve on so I, I think that for me what what that suggests is the question that comes up is how can I devise ways in my life to be more often in contact with that experience of being in contact with the ground of being and have it more frequent instead of thinking that I need to improve something about my moment to moment existence. And sure, that may involve learning and gaining new information and, and skill to do that. But just think about that for a minute. It might be subtle, but to me, that somewhat flips some of our ways of, of our frenetic daily uh, running back and forth um, Yeah, so Pauline just mentioned uh, Lynn McTaggart's The Power of Eight. And yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a good example of, of focus and concentration toward, toward a very particular outcome. And it's not the hardest of science, although there is scientific evidence that can be measured that when we pool our energy and concentration and direct it toward an outcome, 
that seemingly miraculous things can happen that we can't really explain rationally. But what, like Masami said earlier, we can do this in ourselves too. We have the ability to align those energies in ourselves and have seemingly miraculous irrational outcomes that we couldn't have predicted happen when we align all those energies internally and not let them just dissipate and let entropy carry us to just a, a gas cloud in our existence. Anyway, I'll stop talking. Well, um, I think, you know, what Pauline's saying is like that joint mindfulness and it's different than being mindful in a, maybe a retreat or something by yourself and sitting in your own silence versus having a goal together as a group and focusing that's concentration you know the in the tibetan language is called jhana but the jhana is something i've talked about in some of the summits but it's such an important practice is to focus and cultivate concentration that's very actually different than meditation oh although they both end in shun um, concentration is something that really lacks in the school system as well as in our lives now, because you could be reading one article on the internet and then something pops up and it just, you have to click it off. And then the video starts and you go, you got to try to find where the video is and you got to turn it off. And by the time, by the time you're clicking off three things on the screen that you're trying to read, you know, I've already lost my interest or I don't even know where I was reading. Where was I? Right. So um, it, it is important that we do cultivate that. And if we could help as a group, you know, as we come in on Mondays, it's not a long call, but if you could just stay with it, um, however boring this topic is today, or, you know, however much you might be like, well, I don't know. I only wrote three words that they said nothing profound today, you know, however might be your interpretation of today's call. If you could just stay with it just for this hour and not have three devices going at once or three pages going at once, um, I think that will really help us come back to our innate nature that does not actually like going from one thing to another, right? We, our brains really fatigue when we do the switching but it's actually a term, neurological term called switching. And when we can stop doing that, even for a few minutes at a time, maybe build up to one hour on Mondays, that will be a really good thing for your brain. And, you know, it's a, maybe this is a little bit off topic, but I have been, um, I was, I've been really paying attention to language and then the vibration of language and the sounds of the vowels and the consonants and how the consonants basically represent different parts of your limbs, mostly areas that move and the vowel sounds tend to go into more of a center organs, but also across the head and your face. And I've been paying attention to poetry a lot. And so I wanted to actually read one of the poems from um, Hesse, so Herman Hesse about happiness. And I came across this this weekend and I read it, reread it, silently read it, sounded out and read it. And it's just, I listened to it being read. Um, it was, it's really good to just stay with like one poem for a while and really feel into it. So I wanted to share this. Okay. It's called the happiness. As long as you chase happiness, you are not ready to be happy. Even if you owned everything, as long as you chase happiness, you're not ready to be happy. Even if you owned everything, as long as you lament a loss, run after prizes in restless races. You have not yet known peace. As long as you lament a loss, 
run after prizes in restless races. You have not yet known peace. But when you have moved beyond desire, become a stranger to your goals and longings and call no longer on happiness by name, then your heart rises calmly above the ebb and flow of action and peace has reached your soul. And let me read that part again. But when you have moved beyond desire, become a stranger to your goals and longings and call no longer on happiness by name, then your heart rises calmly above the ebb and flow of action and peace has reached your soul. And I thought this poem was timely for me as I have said that the July has been kind of like going through a class five whitewater rafting trip that the, I have no idea when I signed up for that. And I am just frantically trying to go through it. Rapids are crazy. I don't know how many more are left. And I'm realizing that I am getting sucked, sucked into this ebb and flow because I can't quiet down myself enough. And I'm grasping for something that it's not my soul's ultimate calling. So see if you can be in the calmness that is either above the ebb and flow of the water, choppy waters, or just dive deep and go deep into the stillness of that water that is underneath it, that's flowing, but it's not this class five. There's a stillness in that water somewhere. And I, I, I want to turn it over to Chris because I want Chris to um, maybe share his experience with a couple of his near-death experiences, but there's this one in particular that I was there and we were rafting and something happened. So maybe you can take over here. <laughs> yeah, this is on the uh, topic of ebb and flow and um, truly going with the flow. And this, this experience happened uh, probably seven years, almost exactly seven years ago. And we were on a rafting trip on the Green River in uh, Northwest Colorado through Dinosaur National Monument. It's beautiful, beautiful canyon country. And uh, it was a pretty high flow that year. So the river was moving pretty swiftly. The rapids were, were significant at places. And it just so happened that right at the very beginning of the very first day, this was a four day trip and um, Masami and I decided we were going to start out in a kayak and it had been a little while since we'd rowed together. It had been probably two or three years since we'd been on open water like that. And um, <clears throat> so we were still getting used to the coordinating our, our rowing and all of that, but very soon into it, just probably 20, 30 minutes in, we hit the first rapids and we were ahead of everybody. And immediately we got sucked right into it and thrown up against the boulder. And immediately we capsized. And so Asami got pushed out on one side of the boulder down the rapids. I got sucked under on the other side into, um, you know, rafters and kayakers, they call it a keeper's hole where there's a, it's kind of like an air gap where the, the water, that's coming down creates this really strong pressure. And so it was like this giant hand was just holding me pinned down underwater 
um, at the bottom, and it was fairly deep there. So for for me, Im immediately time, my time sense stopped. I knew I was in trouble, but um, there was this this whole process that unfolded that seemed it seemed otherworldly because it took me immediately out of my normal framework of thinking and reacting. And on one hand, my survival instincts took over and I started to fight that giant hand that was holding me under. And for a while, I just couldn't do anything. It was too strong. It was, it was just pinning me down and I was fighting it and struggling. And I finally realized that in my right hand, I still had my, my oar or my paddle. Yeah, it was a paddle. And, uh, and then I, realized I could use that to help pry myself loose, maybe. And so I started using it and pushing and prying, and I put all of my energy into breaking free. And I didn't know if I could. It felt like I wasn't going to be able to, uh, but I kept at it. And finally, finally, I was able to pop myself loose of that incredibly oppressive pressure. And then it, it threw me into the current and I was at the bottom of the river. And so what happened is I realized that I had no idea where I was. I couldn't tell up from down. I was spinning, I was tumbling. Um, I had my eyes open, but the water was just, it was just brown. I couldn't see anything up or down. And I realized I needed to relax. Something just said, let go, just let go. And I, I didn't know what the result was going to be of letting go. It, it didn't say let go if you want to survive. It just said let go. And I had to trust that, that voice. And so what I did is I just relaxed. I essentially went limp for a little while. And what ended up happening is I floated at that point. I wasn't working against myself. And I started to float upward in the current. And eventually I could see that I was coming back up toward the surface as I was being carried downstream. And fortunately for all of this time, there's a happy ending. So if you're nervous right now and you're wondering how it turned out, it turned out okay. I, I, I was safe. Um, so I, I came out and I popped up to the surface and, you know, unfortunately, I mean, I, I'm actually a pretty good swimmer. And it was almost ironic for me to be near drowned um, despite that. And so when I popped up and I realized that I'd been under for an awfully long time, I don't even know exactly by my estimate of how far the rest of the, uh, the boats were down river from me, they're all looking for me down river because they assumed I got swept downstream. But um, when I came up really far behind them, I realized that I'd been under uh, several minutes. I, I'm guessing three or more minutes. And so um, coming up, I still felt this sense of almost relaxation, which sounds really strange when I, when I surfaced at the top. It was almost stranger to come back and, and uh, not be in that state anymore of surrender than it was to realize I had just had that close of a call, if that makes any sense. It was almost stranger to come back to the so-called normal surface. So there's something in this about um, letting go after struggling for long enough. There's a certain amount of struggle that we have to do. And I, I think in my case, if I hadn't struggled some, I couldn't have come up. I, I would have been pinned underwater. So I did my part and I struggled for just as long as I needed to. But then there was a point where the, the, the struggle needed to end and I needed to surrender to bigger dynamics and flow. I mean, it's not coincident. I mean, it's, there, there is a flow that was asking me to come into it so that I could come out. So I'll stop the story there, but yeah. 
Well, yeah, thanks for sharing that. I think, you know, I wanted you to share this story because I feel like collectively, individually, there are different currents and different waves and choppiness that the, we're navigating, but collectively, I think many of us feel we got sucked into that pocket and some of us feel like we have to yank ourselves out of it or we have to somehow, um, I don't know, sheer efforts to come out. But I think if we can just even in this moment, can we just all find relaxations in our own bodies? Can we do that? Just somatically feel. And then many of us will probably sit back a little bit, right? Relaxation doesn't come from like leaning in so much, right? So sit back a little bit, rest your back a little bit. Maybe gently close your eyes, soften your fingertips. What about your toes? I used to work with lots of CEOs and mostly men. And I would ask them to relax and I would look at their toes and their toes would be scrunched up and crunchy like they're all holding on to the earth. So make sure your toes are all relaxed. Maybe wiggle them a little bit. Wiggle your shoulders and just notice where the tension needs your attention. Where in your body, the tensions in your body that requires your attention to bring a sense of relaxation, a sense of trusting this journey, because this is going to continue a little bit. July isn't over yet, everyone. I think we'll soften up a little bit in August. I sense that about the 10th of August is when I'm feeling a little more calmness, but it's not easy right now. Okay. So see if you could sit back into it. If it helps put one hand at the heart, the other hand at the hara. If your mind is buzzing and thinking about, oh my God, when is this going to end so we, I could get to the next, next task, then put your hand to the third eye and maybe other hand at the heart center and see if you could connect those two areas. And as you rest in your own beauty, as you sit back into your inner knowing, I want to share one more poem today. This is the poem that I was reciting over and over and over this weekend. Many emotions. It's by Rumi. I am so small. I can barely be seen. How can this great love be inside me? Look at your eyes. They are small, but they see enormous things. I am so small. I can barely be seen. How can this great love be inside me? Look at your eyes. They are small, but they see enormous things. So I have a homework for all of you. The poems do not have to be very long. It could be a short haiku. Find a poem that really speaks to your heart center, that maybe helps you to bring back that divided self. Because for some reason, this was the poem for me that brought back the smallness of me and the grandness of me that exists always at the same time in me, that I am capable of seeing the enormous things 
and I'm capable of experiencing this great love. So find a poem. Doesn't matter who wrote it. You could, re- you could have written it. But recite it over and over till you memorize it. And I would love for you to share that poem with someone. And share it by sounding it out. Because the sounds are your mantras. Your vibration can shift when you share a poem. So do that. And also share this poem to yourself in silence. And incorporate all your senses with it. Textures of the poetry. The sounds that is not incorporated, but it's underneath or between the words, between the lines. Maybe there's scents. Maybe there's so, you know sense of smell you can f- sense from this poetry. So I encourage you to look for a poem. And if you want to share, you know, you can email me, you can put it up on the Facebook. Um, Maybe share it next Monday, but please share that with someone. Yeah. So I have just one other thing to mention. And that is that I saw in the chat that Deborah had mentioned it, taking an inside out approach versus an outside in or a FOMO, fear of missing out type of approach. And I would say that the fear of missing out is really, it's the fear ultimately of being nothing. That's really what we fear in the world that we're in today. We're, we fear that we amount to nothing, that we are nothing. And that if we don't stay in constant motion, that we'll disappear. That if we give our attention to someone or something else, we'll disappear. That if we don't constantly reaffirm that we're here to ourselves and the world, that we'll disappear. And this is what's both so incredibly poignantly beautiful about sitting still in silence is that it forces you through that. You have to feel it. You have to feel that pull of separation within you. And it's just like that story I shared of being underwater in a river, being swept along. You have to ride through it and move past that. We talked last week about learning only happens in a state of disequilibrium. We have to reach into ourselves to the point of unknowing. And so I would say if we could move into that direction instead of all the re-words we talked about before, and we talked more about unknowing and unlearning what we think we know that that's going to get us closer to that deeper reality that I called it the ground of being, call it whatever you like, but that's what will allow us to touch that and know that there is no perfecting required and that we can be at ease. We can be at peace internally and we don't have to keep struggling to find that because it's there already. So, and it's like Martha said, it's, Maybe if, you know, if it's the reword, it's that rebirthing, right? Yeah. And, re- and just, maybe possibly remembering also. Well, so I have, I have homework if you want to, if you're so moved. Not, to another this. homework? Yep. It's going to oh. work right along with yours. Come on. Okay. Right. <laughs> Dueling homeworks. I left school system a long time ago. Okay. So this one, this one is a, a little bit of a challenge. And I'll I'll just tell you right now, it's something of a modification on a traditional Sufi practice that you might call a heart opening practice. So what, what you would do is sit still, close your eyes, slow down your breathing, and then 
simply start repeating, I am here. I am here. I am here. I am here. And keep doing that for a while until it naturally feels like it becomes silent. You might even whisper it for a little while first. But there are three stages I want you to look at. The first one is using your voice where you're speaking the words. And you may eventually just start saying here, here, here. But it becomes silent. And at first in silence, you're still thinking the words, I am here or here. But as you keep repeating it, if you do it long enough and you're really just loosely holding it, staying, keeping your attention on that feeling of being centered, eventually you're going to sink down to another level, which is your heart. And there are no words happening there, but you're still repeating it. And this may seem contradictory to hear that instruction. You're still repeating, I am here, but you're no longer saying it or thinking it. You're repeating it in your heart. And when you feel like you have really touched the depth, you can start to make your way back up to repeating it in your mind and thinking the words, I am here or here. And then return to a voice with a whisper. And then finally finish speaking it out loud. I am here. That will help you with the fear of missing out and the fear of being nothing. Because you already have everything you need right here, right now. For this moment, you have everything you need. Thank you, Chris. I think we can practice that as homework and then will you take us through that next week? Of in course. the beginning? Okay. Sure. That will be, yeah, that'll be great. Yeah, that brought up tears in me. Hit something really much necessary, Spock. And thank you all of you for all your comments. Um, really enjoyed reading Deborah's comments as well as Joanne's. And then Penny said that came to me once during an anxiety attack. I'd never heard it before, but I just kept saying, I'm Penny, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Deborah. It says, thank you, Chris, that, that is wonderful homework. Nobody says my homework was a good homework here. Is my poetry reciting a good homework? <laughs> all right, that's enough of the silliness. Um, but thank you for all your attentions, everyone. Oh, we love you too, Masami, it says, yes. I love you too, Deborah. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you, thank you, everyone. So um, let's bring our attention back to our heart center again. Let's bring our hands to Namaste. One of the most powerful gestures that we were gifted. Come back to your heart center and know that you are capable of seeing the great, great beauty and unbelievable level of love that we can't even touch it, because it's so enormous. Find that in you, find that in you and know that you're here. Namaste to all of you till next Monday. Namaste.